guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we've got a great interview with Dr. John Ellers, an engineer and private trader. In this interview, we talk about his background, mass entropy spectral dilation, otherwise known as MESA, and how digital signal processing can be applied to technical trading, the pitfalls of backtesting, trading strategy, and how to exponentially grow your trading account. John Ellers was in business school when the Korean War began. He registered to become a pilot, and as a pilot, he became fascinated with electronics. So fascinated that he switched over and became an electronic officer. After leaving the Air Force, he went to college at the University of Missouri, became an electrical engineer, and later on did his doctoral work at George Washington. In his career as an electrical engineer, he designed the data transmitter for Skylab. He designed a friend or foe identification system. It turns out the echo from a radar includes the modulization of jet engine blades. Since every jet engine has a different blade count in first, second, or third layers, those combinations of harmonics identify what kind of engine a jet has. By applying a Fourier transform and matching the pattern, you can identify whether an aircraft is friend or foe. He was also a lead engineer for the defensive suite of both the SR-71 and F-35. And as I said, he is a private trader who uses his engineering knowledge in his trading. If this is your first time to the channel, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you can be notified when we go live and post new content like this. And make sure to like this video and share it with those looking to improve their trading. I hope you guys enjoy Dr. John Ellers. Let's go into that a little bit. So, you know, with that, I mean, obviously that's an extensive background. You've done a lot of work, you know, so how did you become, you know, from that background, which is not, you know, I'd say heavily market intensive. How did you become interested in financial markets and come to apply your background in, uh, in engineering to the financial markets? Uh, well, I got a bonus and uh, I had to do something with the bonus. It was either get into real estate and, or do futures. And I didn't want to fix toilets in the middle of the night. <laughs> and so I got into futures, started trading agricultural corn and soybeans and, and the like. Um, and one time I went to uh, an engineering seminar and I was exposed to this concept of uh, maximum entropy spectrum analysis. And I said, you know, that is a technique that I can apply to my trading. And so I did. And uh, uh, I wrote a little about it in Stocks and Commodities when Stocks and Commodities Magazine was first starting. And uh, people got interested in it. Uh, I knew that Fourier transforms were not the right answer for traders, uh, but uh, Mesa, because it uses a short amount of data, uh, had a better shot at uh, measuring cycles. So I started, I published it, and then one thing led to another, and all of a sudden I found myself being a vendor. Uh, so I kind of came in the back door, didn't mean to do it, but. Uh, because the concept of Mesa kind of caught on. And so I've been doing it uh, as a sideline. And, and since I've retired, it's pretty much uh, full-time research in um, trading techniques and algorithmic trading. For the, for the benefit of our viewers, can you give a brief description of Mesa mass entropy? Sure. Um, I'll give it a shot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when, when I uh, think in terms of digital signal processing, I think of every indicator or every filter that we use as having a transfer um, function. You know, the input, and then there's a black box, and, and the output uh, of that black box, and the ratio between the input and the output is uh, the transfer function. So, like a simple moving average, um, um, is has only coefficients in the numerator of of, a, of that ratio, and something like an exponential moving average that uses back history has a denominator as well. And so, what Mesa does, in, in a nutshell, is it it is a it starts off as a filter and it takes a specific length of data and it does a match filter to the data that's presented to it. 
in terms of the denominator only. So it, to any degree of, of um, sophistication you want or length, um, you can describe that the data in terms of that transfer function. Once you have that filter created, that's what the MESA algorithm does basically. Once you have that filter created, then you kind of put a sweep oscillator through and, and test the filter, see what comes out of it. And uh, as a result of that, you can measure what the cycle or the spectrum content looks like. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's basically a matched filter. It has its um, advantages, it's high resolution uh, for whatever given data you want to present it. And it has some pitfalls. Uh, you can overdo it is the biggest pitfall. And uh, you try to squeeze too much out of it and it'll give you false answers because when you're dividing by a number, if you get that number very close to zero, uh, that, that transfer function will blow up on you. So that's what you have to be careful of with, um, with MESA. You know, so in the realm of technical analysis or technical trading with the end result, you know, applied to, to, to charts or price data, being that we can get cleaner, uh, you know, cleaner actionable information, cleaner price data to act upon or cleaner indicator information to act upon or generate trading signals from. Yeah, you have to pay attention to what the uh, market data looks like. It, market data is what the statisticians call it's not stationary. That is, it's changing all the time. And if it were a pure cycle signal, um, every trade in the world could jump on it. So the cycles that exist in the market are really short lived. And the whole idea of MESA is to use a short enough amount of data that you can isolate those with a fair degree of accuracy. You don't have to depend on averaging like a, a Fourier transform would have to. And that was what you had said, uh, you know, initially that when you were, you know, first looking at the financial markets, you determined that a Fourier transfer was the wrong application simply because the data is so inconsistent. Exactly. You, you, you don't, you, it's basically an averaging kind of function and uh, you're not going to get a high resolution answer on um, one cycle's worth of data, for example. You need uh, several cycles or basically several hundreds of cycles, but that's certainly not possible in market data. Because you have trends that, you know, completely reset cycles. Or it jumps from one period to another period. You know, it'll chirp and it does all kinds of nasty things on you. Now, market data is, is, is one thing I stress. Uh, think about market data this way. If you have a um, chart of weekly data, positioned above a chart of daily data, and they look kind of the same, you know, and they, you can stretch them out and make them look kind of the same. Um, that means that the time scale is different by five to one. And if they look the same, that means the vertical scale must be also scaled five to one. In other words, the market is fractal. Um, that is the longer the period of the cycle in the market, the bigger the swing is going to be. That's called red noise or pink noise, and that's the shape of market data. So um, when you're looking at cyclic data, you have to be very cognizant of, of this effect that I call spectral uh, dilation, that the longer cycles are much bigger. Um, and uh, so if you're going to measure them, for one thing, you've got to take a, a, that into account um, because otherwise the longer cycles would dominate your measurement. In the case of, say, a stochastic, if you make a stochastic, you know, in a trending market, the stochastic is pretty much stuck up against the upper limit. Right. That's because um, this long, the long, longer waves, the trend components are saturating it and just bumping it up against the top. So you, if you want to get a stochastic to work better, you have to equalize the data you're feeding it or remove that trend component before you apply the stochastic. Now, on the assumption you're gonna 
swing trade or uh, have a reversion to the mean kind of uh, trading strategy. Yeah, that is something that you pointed out in our earlier conversation that, you know, this, you know, the looking at levels of cycle analysis, um, you would say, and this was my thought when we were talking about the Fisher transform earlier, was that, uh, you know, what what type of trading strategy would you say, uh, you know, is best employed by looking at this kind of data that not only the indicators that your work has produced uh, produces, um, but also just in general, yeah, the best trading strategy that you can apply with looking at this kind of data. Well, you want to take a look at at, at uh, what the technology is going to offer, and and you talk about a, a uh, Fisher transform. Um, I'll try to come at it backwards. Um, imagine that you have a sine wave that has a swing of plus or minus say three, um, and you put that through a hard limiter and clip it so it can't go any larger than plus one and any smaller than minus one. Well, that clipper turns that original sine wave into a square wave, almost a square wave. Well, and the probability distribution of that square wave, it's e you're either at a plus one or a minus one. So the probability distribution is just two, two spikes one at the high end, one at the low end. So that, so if you look at a an inverse Fisher transform applied to that same sine wave, <clears throat> instead of clipping it, it's a soft limiter. So it kind of squishes it down. And the advantage of doing that is that it kind of removes the annoying wiggles that are in the, if you're looking at the waveform. So um, uh, that's the inverse. And, 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 and so if we go the other way, if you start with a waveform that is limited to plus or minus one, and you apply the Fisher transform to it, that uses um, ex exponents, that exponentials that um, um, basically take that plus or minus one waveform and expand it, say, to plus or minus three. But by doing it um, with the exponentials, it, it gives the necessary fallout that the probability distribution of, of that, that expanded waveform is virtually a, a Gaussian distribution. Mm -hmm. So now you can assess the probability of reversion to the mean just by looking at how far that waveform is deviated from, from zero. You can make your trading decisions based upon the probability of uh, reverting to the mean. So swing trading, reversion to the mean, or reversion to some standard deviation. And I think that's a very interesting concept of the multiple ways to apply the Fisher transform and also the inverse Fisher transform to achieve different results. That's something that I don't think a lot of indicator developers or technical traders take into account when looking at indicators like this. And, and so I think that's a great point that you brought up. The caveat is that your starting waveform has to be limited between plus one and minus one. And uh, there's a couple ways to get there. Number one, you can uh, take um, a, a correlation to a straight line and that will give you swings relative to, you know, going to plus one or minus one. Or you can do what I call an automatic gain control. You can detect the peak of the amplitude and then decay that peak uh, less than 1% per bar thereafter. But every time the waveform exceeds the absolute amplitude, that waveform exceeds that peak, it'll reset it. So now you've got a, a, uh, a secondary waveform that represents the peak amplitudes so you normalize your real waveform to that peak amplitude, and that will automatically keep you swinging between plus one and minus one. Hmm. I've written about that. That's it's an automatic gain control, or AGC is what I call it. I think you're going to inspire a lot of viewers on this to go out and, and read, your, read your stocks and commodities work if they have not already. Yeah, it's, it's there. I think it's in my books, too. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, the other, it's, it's uh, related to the Fisher transform, 
is if you um, take your waveform and square the waveform and sum that square back over a, a number of bars, in other words, get an average of the squared value, and take the root of that, that's root mean square, you can divide that into your waveform and have your waveform normalized to the RMS. Or the, so a, a swing of plus one is one standard deviation. Right. Well, that's another way of going about normalizing to in terms of standard deviations. So we talked earlier um, uh, about you know how you kind of consider your trading. You would consider yourself, uh, I think w the words that you used was a private trader, uh, excuse me, you consider yourself an engineer who privately trades, not a private trader who has an engineering background. That's correct. <laughs> Comes through quite a bit in, in the things I write. My, I, I write uh, uh, fairly tersely. I think code describes what I'm doing is a lot better than English. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I don't spend a lot of effort on words. I put more in the code than uh, it, when I write articles, so. Would you consider, uh, you know, your, your passion here, um, what would you consider your main passion or perhaps more of what you spend your time on, developing or, or trading and, and, and why? Oh, I, I spend almost all my time developing. Um, there are so many variables. I, I, I consider writing a, a really good indicator or a really good trading strategy, something like writing a song. And, and when you get a good one, it's just beautiful. And and uh, and there's enough combinations uh, that there are a lot of variables involved, and, and uh, so you come up with different songs. And and yeah, that's how I get my grins. I get my uh, my uh, enjoyment by by using this technology to come up with with something new and helpful. Yep, that's been a passion of mine as well. You know, when you start off, uh, so many traders begin their journey through trading via discretion. And one thing that we emphasize on the show is, is systems building and system approaches to trading. And it is very, very interesting how that passion can quickly overtake you and, and become, you know, as you said, you know, a work of art. You know, a friend of mine said when it comes to um, art, which, again, I consider code to be, you know, it's never finished. It's just abandoned because you, you put all this work into it and then you say, OK, well, I can continue to make this better or I can continue to you know labor over this for the next five years and get infinitely diminishing returns. But at some point you're like, OK, here it is. Here's my piece of art. It's out in the world now. Enjoy it. And I think that's very true of of code. Uh, I'm sure that you can I'm sure that you can sympathize with this. You know, you get something and you, it's fantastic, but there's always this thought like, uh, what else can I make this thing do? Now, there's a flip side of that, too, is as I start to work on it harder and harder, I, I start to go spiral downhill and go finally end up trashing the whole code and starting all over from scratch. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I could speak to that. I could speak to that. That's happened many times. You've got 19 different versions of the code that you've rewritten, and now you're just unhappy with it. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't even think you know, it's not even a good idea in the first place. What was I even thinking with this thing? Um, can you name a, what are a few highlights of your career that, um, uh, that, that you talked earlier, but, but more specific to the realm of trading, what are a few highlights of your career, your trading career that, that stand out to you and, and why? Well, first of all, um, uh, the thing I remember most are my losses. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, very early in my career, I, I remember I was trading Sugar and I, I knew I was right, and sugar immediately went down three days, limit down three days in a row. You know, I saw my life flashing before my eyes. You know, losing the house, losing the wife, the whole thing. Uh, so that was a sober experience that I'll never forget. Um, and, and and the really bad part of it is after it went down three days, it immediately after it broke the limit, it immediately climbed back up, and I was right. At a technical level, I was right, um, I, and I don't remember why it went down, but it, it did recover and go back up a bunch. And so uh, the lesson I learned was trading is like a business, and you got to be capitalized, uh, just like any business. And so. Um, 
I guess uh, there's a lot of question, or there used to be at least, of how much money does it take? How much capital do you need to, to trade? And and I think m my my view on that is a lot different. Uh, I know Larry Williams will tell you twice the largest drawdown or something like that. Um, and, and I'm not sure drawdown is the right criteria because that's kind of a black swan event. Sure. Um, what I, I think in terms of probabilities a lot. And so um, if you, and I'll kind of lead you through it this way. If you have a really a pretty good system that has 60% winners, that means it has 40% losers. Any trade can lose, has a 40% probability of losing. That means two trades in a row will lose with a probability of 0.16. And four trades in a row is the square of that or about 0.02. And six trades in a row, you're going to lose about 0.004. Four tenths of a percent probability of having six losers in a row, which is pretty low. But if you're trading uh, daily bars and you trade once a day, 250 trades a year times 0 0.004, that's 1.0. In other words, if you're trading every day, it's, it's almost a promise you're going to have six losers in a trade in in a row someplace. Sure. So you've got to steal yourself to have at least that many that many losses. And so, how much capital do you need? Um, my rule of thumb is I look at my at my uh, strategy and the average trade loss per trade times ten plus the initial margin if it's on futures. So margin plus ten lose, average losers in a row is is about the capitalization rule of thumb that I use. That's very interesting. And, but I bear in mind that that's, that takes you down uh, almost to a limit uh, or, or a margin call. So uh, you're gonna have some substantial drawdowns percentage wise if you use that criteria. So maybe, maybe double that? <laughs> well, whatever, you know, what, you can put, build your own comfort level uh, into it. Uh, I think using probability of losses times your average loss is a better criteria than looking at drawdown. Yeah, I, I agree with you. On that same vein, would you mind sharing with us, you know, how, how you manage risk or, or how you view position sizing? Because that's something that we focus on a lot on this channel is risk management and position sizing as really the only influencer of how much an absolute value, of course, you are going to win or lose on a trade is your position size. And, you know, we have a lot of different formulas and methods that we teach for how to um, how to find a good risk ratio. Uh, so, you know, what do you look at when position sizing for a trader or how do you manage risk, you know, given into account everything that you just talked about? Uh, well, the other side is how fast you want to grow. Um, uh, so I'm a cowboy you know, when it comes to trading. Uh, you know, I, I I am not cautious in, in trading. I know there is risk and I accept the risk. So um, um, let's uh, let's talk about ES and uh, and I'll wave my arm in round numbers uh, you, just to make it intelligible. Sure. Suppose I have three hundred and fifty dollars loss per trade on the average in trading intraday. And uh, so that would be $3,500 I'd have to have to cover my 10 losses in a row. And intraday margin is about $1,500 or so. So I need about five grand to trade an ES contract. So as I accumulate, so the other side of your question is, as you accumulate profit, I start with five grand. And by the way, I will go underwater before I, get to 10 grand, but when I reach 10 grand, now I've got enough cash um, to trade two contracts and so on. So for every five grand more, you lay on another contract. Mm -hmm. And now that way, um, your growth becomes exponential. And at some point, uh, 
you're going to say I, that's too much risk and you're, you'll back off. Uh, you know, when, when you start trading 10 contracts that way, um, you're saying, I don't need to put all that money at risk. And so you'll back away. Um, um, you're making enough money that you don't worry about risk so much. The risk factor is the function uh, of, of your comfort level. Um, and so it's going to be variable. But if you're starting out and you want to make a lot of money fast, um, you, you want to have the exponential growth, but still have enough money to live another day when you have a loss. Which is the, the exact method that you talked about when realizing, you know, exactly how much capitalization do you need? Some of our members are going to really enjoy hearing that. I'm a pretty, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty consistent. Uh, I've been, you know, utilizing, you know, standard distance to stop loss, uh, to determine position sizing, you know, risk ratio, one to 2%, uh, risk per trade. Uh, generally my max risk per trade is going to be somewhere, uh, it's going to be 3%. That's the most risk I'll ever take on a trade. And that's relative to my, my entire trading capital. Yeah. You're more conservative than me. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Hey, I'm, I'm the one interviewing you, right? So, um, you just talked about the ES there. What uh, what markets do you have experience in trading and do you feel, uh, you know, are in your wheelhouse the most comfortably? I started trading uh, agriculturals, uh, corn and soybeans, uh, live cattle, live hogs, pork bellies, and that kind of thing. Um, but one lesson that stuck with me quite a bit, back in those days, um, believe it or not, to exercise a trade, it was a $100 a round turn commission. No, and not even thinking about slippage, but just $100 a round turn slip, uh, commission. Corn is running around $50 a bushel. So you had to have a two point move in order just to make your commission back. <laughs> and so the, <laughs> uh, uh, things have changed uh, in, in the electronic world. So, um, but that kind of experience uh, still makes me uh, consider the cost per trade as part of of my system development cost, you know, I uh, I have to make a lot more than than slippage and commission uh, to make a given strategy worthwhile trading. Mm -hmm. So that determines how often I trade because the swings in the market are dependent upon the duration of of, of the period. Um, so I've gone from uh, the big uh, uh, S&P contract, which I traded uh, in the in 90s, I was you know trading that on 45 minute bars, but holding it overnight. And so you know, the, the margin was, as I recall, pretty pretty substantial back then. But then when the E-mini came along, that changed everything. The, the margin was uh, smaller, and you, you can trade it electronically, and that introduced um, real algorithmic trading for me. And so I've switched over to trading. Uh, and also I don't like stocks uh, at all because they're news driven more than than uh, statistics driven. And, and so it's, uh, I prefer trading ES and I'm ES or NQ, something like that. And of course I trade uh, algorithmically and automatically. Uh, I'm completely automated. I don't watch. I don't even know what my systems are doing during the day. I just do what you tell them to and 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 and, and execute. And I find watching the market it, it's 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 like watching paint dry, punctuated with moments of sheer terror. <laughs> uh. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. Uh, you sit there if you watch a if you watch a ticker for you know eight hours a day. It's it's mostly boring, followed by periods of sheer terror or sheer exhilaration. But usually that exhilaration is still tinged with terror because that exhilaration comes when it's moving in your favor, and then that thoughts in the back of your head it could turn around any moment. Yeah. So I avoid the, the the emotions of the market by not watching it. There you go. Very smart. And that's exactly what we do. Yeah, we trade. We trade once a day. Uh, we don't trade intraday. 
as our default strategy we just trade once per bar close you know once immediately prior to bar close and we look the next you know prior to bar close and we sort it out there mm -hmm. it's a very similar approach um and you you spoke on there about what markets you have preferred to trade how your preferences have shifted over the years from you know moving from agriculturals and commods to uh to to indice contracts and indice futures uh and now trading so do you trade currently on the the, the minis the micros are you back to the big contracts I've looked at the micros uh but again i don't like those so much because uh i can't make as much money and the and the ratio of profit to cost uh, per round turn it would force me into probably position trading um more than intraday trading and so i still I, i'm comfortable with the uh day trading the e-minis what uh, what trading platforms do you currently use well that's uh, um that's almost historical I, I started out with CompuTrack uh on the old apple II when that went away and and the pc came in i started using system writer by omega research which turned into tradestation and so it's simply two things. I've, I've used it forever. And that easy language is almost like English to me. I, you know, it, I can write code as easily as I can speak. And, and so I've stuck with TradeStation. Now it's one size fits all. You know, it's really, really easy to get data and, 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 automate your trades and it's just comfortable, uh, like an old pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, um, multi-charts is just a, basically the same thing, except you have a little more flexibility on who your broker is, and but you gotta struggle to get your data a little more, so. Yeah. Uh, um, but because of the language and because I spend most of my day writing code or testing things, uh, uh, I prefer easy, easy language is really for where I live. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. I have to work on what you're comfortable with. You talked uh, just a little bit ago about how your trading was fully automated. Um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you, how do you perform that? Do you, you write your own bots? Do you use some third party service? Do you utilize uh, TradeStation? No, I use, I write my own and, and, um, well, the platform is TradeStation. So, <laughs> Um, everybody knows that back testing um, um, with in sample data, you can produce almost anything you want. You know, you can make it look good, and you can you can curve fit and all those kinds of things. Uh, um, so I'm finding that I have to write my own walk forward optimizer, and so I'm using that quite a bit now. Um, I, I look, I, I walk it forward and, and, uh, day by day and, and I trade from that walk forward optimizer. So you, you, so you do do traditional back testing, but you'd say, you know, obviously, yes, we're, we're, we're aware of. It depends on what platform you're utilizing, what what your sample data looks like, you know, what your loop is, how things are calculated. It's back testing is one of those things that when people first get into it, they think it's easy and they're like, "Oh, I'll just simulate what it would have done in the past." Well, it's not that easy cuz code only does exactly what you tell it to do. And so um so you uh you, you do you do traditional back testing and then take the results that you find interesting and then forward test them on live data? Um, yeah, that's how I start, um, a, a, a new strategy. Um, um, I have some fairly rigid criteria, uh, for how I build a, a strategy nowadays. Um, the problem I've, and I've identified some problems with, with system writing as a function of doing the back testing. Um, one reason that back back testing looks good is it it you it works on a combination of parameters uh, if you have four optimizable parameters that you're fi uh, fiddling around with um it's not they they do interact and and so the first criteria that i have um 
or my strategy is that the components must nominally be uncorrelated. Uh, for example, the price action and its rate of change, if you correlate those, try to correlate those two, they're, they, they have a fairly low correlation. And if they're a pure sine wave and cosine wave, you know, ideally they're uncorrelated. Uh, so, um, but price and rate change of price are uncorrelated. So that, that's a start for a lot of systems that I built. On the other hand, if you take price and say daily volume on, on the EF in particular, uh, obviously the volume's high at the open and close and it's almost a perfect sine wave every day. Right. Uh, not a sine wave, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's got a daily swing where it's high at the open and at the close and low in the middle of the day. Um, so what happens is your price action can either be highly correlated or highly uncorrelated, and it swings. And if you try to incorporate volume and price together in a strategy, you're going to get killed because the probabilities are of, of, of combinations of those two are swinging violently during the day. And even though you might have something that tests out historically uh, quite well, uh, if you put it through a walk forward, it's going to fall apart. And uh, so this idea of using uncorrelated components is, is a key issue because it minimizes the interaction between uh, the combinations of those as you experience new data. And so this is why, for example, um you know, systems builders, particularly those, you know, well, any systems builder will notice that, uh, you know, like, say, for example, that they are experimenting with, uh, let's take a simple example, right, of trading on a moving average crossover. And the things that they can change are going to be the, let's say, the smoothing of the moving average, you know, shifting between a simple moving average or a relative moving average or an exponential, uh, and the look back length. And then say they're also looking at well, as you as you said, let's let's what would be another highly correlated factor rather than volume? Because obviously we'll get struck down if we look at volume. But you know, what would be something in your opinion that would be correlated to those two things? One thing would be highly correlated is if you use a double moving average, mm -hmm. the two averages themselves are correlated because one has more lag than the other. That's all. They're going to interact uh, pretty violently in a, in a strategy. Yeah, I think the the concept that I was that I was looking for here was, you know, we can notice in strategy testers that you will change, you will make like very minute changes to something. You would be like, well, what's it look like? Okay, I'm getting good results with a look back length of 15 on this moving average, but if I change it to 16 or 14, now it's a negative strategy. I used to think, you know, if you got uh, two two uh, components in your in your strategy. And you're going to look at them. The results of the combinations are are like a fuzzball. That is, the two components can be described in terms of latitude and longitude, and their interaction would be the radius or or the, or the, foot, the length of the fuzz on the on on the fuzzball. But what I find is when you have correlation uh, between your components. It's not a fuzzball anymore. It's a cactus leaf. You know, it's got spikes on it. Yeah. And it's really easy to jump from spike to spike to spike uh, and think by averaging, and you think you've got it, but it, it, there's giant holes between the spikes that are going to appear in the future. So you have to get around those spikes. I've, on, on this two-dimensional fuzzball, what, one thing I tried that doesn't work is um, you try to average not over a point, you know, find the point that works, but find a patch. You know, if you go plus or minus one from any position on that fuzzball in in two in latitude and longitude, that's a rectangle basically of of nine components, and that, in other words, you're averaging over an area uh, around the fuzzball. That doesn't seem to work. It doesn't work because it varies with time. It, the, the data that you've got is non-stationary. So that, that patch is going to move around. So you need some time, time averaging uh, 
in there. The thing I find in my in my uh, walk forward optimizer is the criteria for assessing the the optimum solution is to use the perfect profit correlation. That gives you some time some time averaging. Okay. So I mean, th listen that that can get that can become a very nuanced and complicated thing on strategy building, but that can be summed up by you have to be very very careful in understanding what data is going in to your algorithm or into your backtest and what you're telling your backtest to do exactly how you're telling it to, to calculate and i think that's what a lot of people well newer individuals will forget right they they just need to you really need to spend some time learning you can try to do is uh to give it new data of course there's lots of ways uh, uh trade it out of sample or you can trade and say if you write it for ES, you can trade it on on NQ, which is similar but different data, and see if it still works. Yeah, that's something that we do. Obviously, we we train uh, or we teach training our data on eighty percent of available data, and then testing it on the twenty percent that it wasn't trained on. And if it performs well, okay. If it performs bad, well, then you've curved fit somewhere. Right. Right. So in modern, so so nowadays, uh, are there any particular setups that you look for without, you know, you don't have to give us your old trading strategy, but, it, you know, we talked about, you know, there's reversion to the mean, there's a raw reversal trade, you know, picking tops and bottoms, there's trend following, there's, you know, all sorts of different strategies. And I know you, you trade intraday on the futures, you know, are there any, you know, roughly, you know, and, and broadly, any particular setups that you favor trading lately? No, that, I, I think setups are kind of a, discretionary uh, approach. Uh, I, I obey, you know, I don't watch what's going on. Uh, and uh, when a rule gets hit, uh, I, my machine buys or sells. There you go. Good way to do it. So what would you say, you know, was, was kind of the inspiration or motivation to creating your indicators in the first place or what's, you know, what you have developed so far? I think I'm I'm different than most because I fairly uh, rigorously apply uh, digital signal processing techniques, and and I use statistics, um, but no, I'm not a statistician. That is, uh, I take an engineering approach where it's good enough. You know, I'm not trying to seek perfection, but uh, I'm trying to apply scientific techniques. Uh, things that are known to work well in the real world and uh, apply them to trading. So when I see um, things misapplied, it bothers me a great deal. You know, I, as I told you before, things like the Gortzel algorithm. It's, it's an algorithm that's used by the telephone company to sense um, the touch tone um, keys but it has no uh, application to trading because it doesn't realize that that uh, the market data is non-stationary. It requires it's basically a very narrow band filter. And so when I see people trying to apply, misapply technology, it uh, it's all I can do to stop them from writing a letter to the editor. <laughs> I hold in my hand a strongly worded comment about how you are not doing things correctly. Yeah. Um, you know, you started trading decades ago. What are some, and you touched on this a little bit, but what are some other kind of big differences between, you know, trading back then as opposed to modern day trading? Well, from a, you know, I'm, I'm deep into cycles and I look at things from a, from a spectrum kind of perspective. One thing that's happened quite a bit over the years is uh, that the periodicity of the cycles have shortened up. That, uh, you know, I don't assign causality to things, but uh, in those days, everybody was trading off the, in the, on the floor and a lot of manual stuff was going on, so there was a lot of lag time. Um, and now by shifting, you know, the stocks are on a fractional basis. Now we've got electronic trading going on. Uh, as it evolved, there was a whole bunch of discussion about electronic trading and the best way to do it, and was it was it going to be efficient and and uh, and so we've evolved now into um, electronic almost 100 percent. 
Sure. And the result is that people are reacting faster. Typically, the, the cycle periods have shortened. But in, on, on stuff like the S&P, there's still an underlying monthly cycle, more or less. Uh, and you can assign causality to that. Every manager up and down the chain in a company has to make his numbers by the month. And so kind of why I think uh, there's a monthly cycle there in, that you the traders can take advantage of if they're trading on a daily basis. Sure. Interesting edge to walk out to watch out for. Okay, a, a few more questions here. What's um, uh, you know, we talked about algorithmic traders. Have you seen a growth in interest for Mesa or uh, or DSP technology or solutions from algorithmic traders, or is the demand stronger from manual traders still? You know, DSP takes a certain background. I mean, you have to, have to be mathematical. Uh, and, and a lot of traders uh, are not. You know, they, 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 they deal and trade with the gut. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think I have a big enough platform to make a judgment of how, how the market is swinging. Uh, but the general sense I have is that people are learning to use computers more and are learning to trust uh, the computations that come out of a computer be better than they're trusting their own gut. And especially, you know, your audience are highly technical, I'm sure. And, and uh, so, uh, but I've got, I've got a buddy uh, who I've tried to ex explain tech technical trading to him, but uh, he just doesn't get it. <laughs> just, and so he's, he does his own thing. Yeah. Buy when it's green and sell when it's red. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I definitely noticed that in my own life. We attempt, you know, so hard to teach technical strategy and risk management and psychology, all the things that we feel are necessary to be a trader and to take this down the long road. And it's, uh, you know, what is, what is, you know, I've been doing this for, for quite a while now, and I have noticed the wind shift a little bit. I have seen an increased interest in technical trading and systems building and discipline and more mathematically inclined, more computer inclined individuals coming into, uh, coming into the market. So. It is. I think that I think the winds are shifting in a favorable fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, uh, languages by themselves have come a long way. Uh, Python is now available, and a lot of libraries are out there. And so, just programming is becoming more available to the general public, um, and they're more exposed to it in their everyday lives. You know, they're watching this video, for example, uh, uh, it's, and and. And it's getting more so now that people are cooped up. Uh, they're going to go to Zoom and have conferences online. And so they're coming just in general more comfortable with technology than they used to be. Uh, when you were learning how to trade, did you, you know, did you have a mentor or did you have, you know, um, you know, where did you kind of go to seek, seek guidance from? Hmm. It's going to sound kind of arrogant, uh, but I saw people doing point and figure and arguing about the right threshold for a stochastic and, and doing wave counts. And so frankly, I just thought in the land of the blind, the one-eyed king, man is king. And so I just did my own thing. I tried to use my, my engineering technology in, in the trading, that's all. That's worked out well. Okay, if you could offer two questions here that are kind of similar. If you could offer um, a traders watching this any advice, what would it, what would it be? Uh, the main thing is be educated. Uh, we've talked about a lot of top topics during our conversation here. Um, one is uh, the dangers of back testing, and so you have to be aware of of the minefield that you're stepping into, and you, you got to know what to avoid and, and don't make the same mistakes other traders have made before you. So education is, is uh, super important. There's a lot of misinformation out there, so you gotta learn to filter out the misinformation from the good stuff. Uh, it boils down to education. Uh, and 
try to read books. Uh, I guess my favorite book uh, would be Perry Kaufman. Uh, that's comprehensive. That uh, uh, it's a book that covers almost every technique that is. Um, some I don't agree with, but that's okay. That's uh, that's uh, he does as good a job as I can think of in one book uh, to cover the the whole area of technical analysis. Mm -hmm. And do you, would you have any, um, the other question is, you know, would you have any, because so many of our audiences are systems builders and systems traders, um, you know, uh, one piece of advice to, and this might be the same thing, beware of backtesting, but one piece of advice to someone developing a new strategy or edge or, or indicator. I would say if you've got the, um, programming skills, write it as a walk forward optimizer. That way you can make sure that that it works not just over, well, my own rule is it's got to work over several hundred trades um, successfully with a, with a high probability of, of, um, of winning trades. High probability is greater than 55%. Hmm. And a profit factor on the order of 1.5 or so out of sample. It doesn't sound like much. It adds up. <laughs> it adds up. But that's out of sample data as opposed to the glory numbers that are usually advertised. Uh, if, if you can write something that has uh, 55 to 60% winning trades uh, and a profit factor 1.5, you, know, you, can, you can retire. That's, that's good news for the systems traders out there. Because I know a lot of systems traders are shooting much, much higher than that. You know, they they think they need a profit factor of two or three and a hit rate of eighty percent. You know, of course, you know we're daily traders, so we we trade less frequently. But yeah, uh, again, it that's a function of how many trades you're talking about. If you talk, if you're talking over five hundred trades. I don't think there's anybody that can do that over five hundred trades. Frankly, the data is just shifting too much. Uh, that. Uh, your rules don't you can't cover all 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 the bases. Naturally, if you can, my my hat goes off. <laughs> hey, we need we need we need the holy grail to to continue to search for, right? I mean, that's one thing about trading, right? We're just it's a it, it's a place where people can come to constantly improve, constantly innovate, and constantly push forward, and that's what's really inspiring about my job and the work that everybody does uh, in the realm of trading. Yeah, it, 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 um, that's my feeling too. I, I try to write about what I, I find and if traders can pick it up and things like the Fisher transform, whatever, uh, and use it successfully, you know, I've done my job. Well, we really appreciate it, uh, Mr. Ellers. I mean, your work has been inspirational to me and I know a lot of individuals on my team and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down today and talk about yourself and, and your experience. No, like I said, it's my pleasure. It's been uh, a lot of fun. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Johnny. Have a great day. You too. Hey guys, thanks for watching the interview. If you'd like to improve your trading with mentoring from Dr. Ellers, I recommend that you check out his three-day personal workshop. New topics this year include generating successful performance, why back tests can fail, the pitfalls of walk-forward optimization, and much, much more. It takes place this October from the 16th to the 18th in San Simeon, California. For more information, head to mesasoftware.com and click on Learn More on the Ellers Workshop icon.